I think of the World Humanitarian Forum, it takes me back to 2015 when we were in Istanbul. I think many of us who are on the screen were there together, uh, and perhaps many who are uh, watching this as well from around the world. And it was an interesting moment. And uh, the, the key theme that came out of that session for me was a question that we at DevEx were asking uh, in our journalism around the world, which was, is the humanitarian system broke, merely broke, or is it broken? Um, and that generated lots of interesting conversation during the summit, the sense that we had, a, had a, obviously a huge financing gap, but could we envision a new way forward, a new, a new design for the humanitarian system in the future, given the increasing number of conflicts and crises, the growing challenges related to climate. And I think that, that theme has really continued over these years. Now, of course, here we are in 2020, we would normally be gathering perhaps at the UN General Assembly for their 75th anniversary, perhaps a slightly celebratory moment because of that. But the challenges I just described have gotten worse since 2015. And of course, now we're facing a global pandemic that is setting back so many of the targets and goals related to the SDGs, humanitarian and development alike. So as I understand it, our goal here today, and the organizers have gathered an impressive group of leaders on these issues, is to think about what is the opportunity coming out of this moment. The World Economic Forum is calling for a great reset, as they call it. Well, what would that mean when it comes to the humanitarian and development sectors? What would a great reset look like for the work that, that all of us are doing as we try to achieve the sustainable development goals? Again, which are we're off track in many areas and now are far off track due to this year of the pandemic. What could we do to rethink the opportunity that we have before us? I thought I might turn first to Sarah Puntigliano, who is the Chief Executive of the Overseas Development Institute um, and someone we have spoken with on, on these issues over many years now to get your take on this. I know you've played a lead role, Sarah, on humanitarian issues for many years. Has your thinking changed due to the pandemic and this great reset opportunity as the WEF describes it? Hi Raj, nice to connect to you with you again and you know to see so many friends on this panel. Um, my thinking hasn't changed. If anything, the pandemic has uh, reinforced what I've been saying for many years. Um, you know, you talked about the World Humanitarian Summit. Just ahead of the summit, we published, we released a report that you know has been much talked about. The title of which was "Time to Let Go," and we were really advocating strongly um, for a deep. Um, reset really of the humanitarian se sector at the time, uh, where we were asking really to let go of the power and control that really stifled the sector. There was very much focus around wrong incentives that define success around growth, around money, around, you know, sort of growth of budgets and growth of staff. So already at the time we were, you know, saying that the big problem in the sector was, you know, we call it this enduring um, you know, cultural paternalism that basically meant that, you know, the, the northern, the western, if you want, model sector knew better and in a new um, basically confined a lot of the, um, the leadership around the standards set by the North. So the pandemic has told us once again that we need to act very differently. You know, we need to reframe the way we operate in the sector. We need to make sure that those who are at the front line, you know, those who are, you know, the local responders, those who are at the heart of, you know, the, of the crisis, both north and south, both, you know, in, the, in rich countries and in poor countries, are those that need to lead these responses. And that the global system is just no longer fit for purpose in, in any way. So it's, it, the problem is not that it's broke, it's really broken. You know, there are, there are fundamental problems to multilateralism that we need to rethink. Um, and, and, you know, in many ways, the pandemic has shown, you know, such a, a, a problem in terms of international cooperation that we need to think very differently in terms of the cooperation that we want to see. And to me, it's really the time to think about, you know, multi-stakeholder, you know, cooperation is not just about governments, but brings together the best of civil society, the best of businesses around shared purposes, alliances that can achieve objectives around, you know, a, a concrete um, aim that everybody wants to see realized, be that climate change or around human rights, or, you know, whatever objective they set. And we have seen alliances come to the yeah. fore, especially during the pandemic, whether it's Gavi, around vaccine okay, access yeah. or CEPI around vaccine development or the Global Fund. I mean, the idea of using the multilateral system to develop fit for purpose alliances 
is probably more prominent today due to the pandemic than before. But Sarah, you gave quite an indictment, I think, of where we are and what's required. And I wonder, maybe I could bring Ahmed al Maraki into the conversation. He's a special advisor at the Office of the UN Humanitarian Envoy. I saw you nodding along a bit, Ahmed, and I want to get your take as well. Do you, do you similarly see that we have a crisis of multilateralism today? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank World Humanitarian Forum for inviting me for this uh, panel, and I would like to congratulate them for the two days of uh, discussion. Well, um, I think, uh, as Sarah said, uh, the business, uh, as usual, it won't be the same. So uh, doing the business uh, should be changed. Um, I, I will I will look at that in in other perspective uh, where I'm the preparedness for partnership it is very important uh, I think uh, COVID nineteen pandemic it's uh, we taught a lot of from from it so we have to be prepared before and the private sector play a very big role in 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 this uh, scenes this is why i'm i have an initiative which is called a global humanitarian action executive uh, uh, aligned or a global humanitarian action executive alliance to where is the the business leader dedicated to inspiring ambitions mobilizing action and accelerating progress toward achieving this uh, dg 17 and delivering humanitarian um, assistance um, this initiative looking for a mechanism try to think out of the box try to uh, bring the know-how of the private sector uh, because the private sector they are doing very well in terms of their project and uh, the way that they are implement their project how can we bring the know-how from the private sector to do it the same with the UN agencies so this platform is uh, gathering um, and try to bring everybody in one platform try to think out of the box, finding the mechanism that help the UN agencies in, in one hand and the private sector in the other hand to work together using the know-how of the private sector, using the knowledge and the survey and the, uh, the knowing of the situation from the UN agencies and to try to work together. So the partnership, it should, shouldn't be happened when the crisis uh, during the crisis, it should be happened beforehand. So I think the partnership here play a very big uh, role. Maybe we can uh, go a little bit deeper on this idea of where the private sector fits in by bringing Blair Shepard into the conversation. Blair is the global leader for strategy and leadership at PwC and has a, a long uh, experience as a professor, academic, and leader in, in the business field, um, including at Duke University. Um, Blair, what's your take listening to Ahmed and his, his ideas around how the private sector can help re-energize perhaps some UN functions and hearing Sarah's views about the kind of broken nature of our humanitarian system today? What would you like to add? Yeah, so, so actually we're working with Dr. Marecki on that issue ourselves, right? And so I'm highly supportive of it because I think it's a massively important thing. I, I do think there's a couple of pieces to pick from, from what both of them have said, and I want to add a couple more. But first thing is, um, it, it turns out the private sector has access to capital, and a lot of the public sector actually now has massive debt, right? And so there's a money need, actually. Um, there's actually capacity that sits in the private sector that doesn't sit in either civil society or the public sector. And so I think you need, as Sarah said, and Dr. Marcus said, to sort of bring the um, private sector, civil society, and public sector together. And I think you need to do that in an interesting way, which is you need to create a global architecture to make sure it's done right, it's done it properly, it's done fairly, it's done efficiently, but it has to be incredibly local in terms of its execution, because the the challenges are completely different from context to context to context, right? And, and so there's this kind of paradoxical quality that's required, which is consistent global uh, process, you could think of it, but, but very local content. Um, 
And I think if we don't do that, it won't work, right? Um, second thing I think that's important is we have to realize we've got to repair the damage from COVID at the same time we're rethinking the system. And that's really a leadership challenge of huge magnitude because the attention that's going to be required just to repair the damage is huge. But it turns out what COVID did was make all the issues you described at the start, Raj, actually way more challenging than they were before. So we accelerated and we wrote this book 10 years to midnight. I think it's now eight years rather than 10 years. And so, so it's accelerated it. And I think that we have to put things together that normally don't fit together. Right? And I think there's another one that's really critical, which is we have to find one or two things the world just agrees on. I mean, part of why multilateralism isn't working is we can't agree, right? Um, and there's some other issues, but we can't agree. Let's just find one or two things the world completely agrees on. Let's drive that and then have the local answers be related to the complete set of SDGs, right? And so, for example, I think it's hard to envision, I mean, if, if we don't solve the climate issue in a decade, we're really in trouble as a species, right? If we don't somehow become way more inclusive, way faster, we're likely to see significant revolutions on our hands, right? And, and so I think let's just agree on a couple of things that are absolutely clear, drive those together globally, and then create an architecture to allow local instantiations of that are quite different from each other. So, so I'm- Yeah, completely... just on, on that last point, Blair, I, I interviewed a few days ago, Mark Lowcock, who's the UN humanitarian chief as part of our coverage of the General Assembly this year. And he says he can already see a direct line, a direct connection from the pandemic to rising political instability in many parts of the world. Yes. And that we should expect, uh, obviously the pandemic has a has a trajectory from a health standpoint, and that's what most people are, are focused on. When is there a vaccine? When is it available? What does treatment look like? But there's second and third order effects, particularly in many low and fragile income and fragile countries uh, that could have much longer term effects. Clearly push people off a cliff, Raj. And, and that actually, when people are pushed off a cliff, they do something in response. So I think the important point in that is there's a huge incentive for shareholders to care about this conversation we're having right now. Um, and, and so we should have a lot of people with capital listening because you know, you, you know the first people who went to the guillotine in the French Revolution, right? Um, and so they should keep that in mind. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. I want to bring uh, Javier Castellano into the conversation. I hope I got your name right. I couldn't quite see the whole name there, Javier, but um, you are the Undersecretary General at the IFRC, um, and uh, you know you work every day in some of the most fragile, challenging environments around the world, delivering direct humanitarian services. Do you feel that we're similarly, as we've heard before, at this at this moment where our system really isn't up to the challenges before us and we need to rethink in a new way? Do you see the reset concept as relevant to your work at IFRC? Well, uh, definitely all the times we have to, to accept that we have to reset every, every time a shock happens and to have the opportunity for us to understand what has happened and how has impact uh, communities, how communities have responded and how impact in institutions and, and the, in the humanitarian ecosystem. If I look, the, the, the first critical component when we look uh, how shocks are affecting, uh, affecting the world, if you look at uh, the, the example of COVID, what you have as a fact is that the first responders have been individuals, families, communities, and their own set. And the, the ecosystem, the humanitarian ecosystem is still looking into the international-led approaches. And COVID put a, 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 a pause to say this is a totally local-based response. So definitely what is important in this reset is to recognize, first of all, the power of local action and how the local, local action is capable to achieve much more than we might think they were able to achieve in the past. And this is a, a, a significant paradigm shift in terms of how we plan, how we organize, where we put the resources, and how we invest the resources to increase capacities at the local level. So the paradigm shift is how the humanitarian ecosystem is willing to put the trust, first of all, in the financial, from the financial perspective, and second, in, in terms of the investment to 
to ensure that uh, resilient communities, resilient, resilient individuals, families make resilient institutions. Have we made progress on that, Javier? Because that's precisely one of the core themes we talked about in 2015 at, in, in Istanbul, right? The idea that very little of the global humanitarian spend actually goes to local organizations who may be most well positioned to actually make change in their community. Do you feel like we've made progress on that point? I think we have um, done a little progress. When we looked at 2% of the financial resources is what has reached and goes to the community. The only progress that we have made, it has been a result of a shock. And this shock of COVID is the progress that is going to really transform. But it's forced I think us to do it. We, we, right, we couldn't, we, yeah, we couldn't put Americans and Europeans on planes. So we had to, we had to send money more locally, right? If we were forced into the situation. Maybe it's a, a thin silver lining of the, of the circumstances we face. Sorry to cut you off. I, I do want to bring Maria Kozlowski into the conversation. Maria is the Senior Vice President for Innovative Finance at the Rockefeller Foundation. And I think maybe you can tack on directly to what Javier was describing, because this is a money problem in, in a sense. There's not enough funding. It's also not going to the right places. How do we bring an innovative approach maybe with, with this broader theme of a great reset? Um, well, thank you, Raj, um, and uh, I'm happy to be part of this group. You know, at the foundation, one uh, thing we just keep focusing on right now is, my goodness, in 25 weeks of a pandemic, we've upended 25 years of development work, really. And so how do we, as we think about like this reset and uh, a few of you have also mentioned the need to get a lot of actors into the tent. So how do we get all of the actors into the tent? But let's also recognize um, it's really difficult to get all actors into the tent at once. We each have different ways to be most effective. What we're trying to think through at the foundation is, first of all, how do we go deep? And right now, um, our deep is twofold. Um, one is dealing with the pandemic right now. And a lot of the focus on the foundation has been testing, tracing, and ultimately um, vaccine distribution. And as we think about this, really, how do we make sure that the most vulnerable parts of the populations are supported? Because if we don't do that, um, we also don't get through the pandemic in an effective way. And then as we come out of this um, galvanizing um, structural change for the greener, smarter, fairer recovery. Um, and from an innovative finance perspective, I think as a, as a philanthropic organization, we see ourselves as a bit of a bridge. So we can kind of convene governments, perhaps the development institutions, impact investors, ultimately the private sector, to think about what are investment offerings that also enable us to tackle each of these. But, you know, as I sit and, and listen to some of the commentary, on the one hand, we want to have a discussion on what the reset should be, but we also have to make sure whatever offerings we come up with um, whatever we're doing is that we don't spend too much of our time on agreeing on what, what's the, the ultimate goal. I mean, I think having execution in bite sizes that we really can bring the capital in immediately and in a way that um, each of our different types of organizations can be tackling the things that we're best at is really important. And it's really important that the dollars go to the local economies. Because if, if we spend too much time on the grand vision, we may not get to the executable steps. And certainly with this, you know, having upended everything in 25 weeks, I think uh, the reset, the timing urgency, the need to go deep, and I would say the need to execute quickly so that we can help get the dollars to the global reset. You know, as we think about offerings at the foundation and how we can kind of pool capital, how can we convene to agree on certain um, priorities, uh, that timing urgency is behind all that we're doing um, as we try to think about what makes the most sense for pooling capital in. 
Yeah, it's it's a, a bit like what Blair was saying before that we're in the depth of a, a really serious crisis. We both have to address that and lead our way out of it at the same time, which is a real challenge. And Sarah, one of the things that I think is going to make this more challenging is there was a growing theme. We heard about it in Istanbul. We've heard about it since then at the Addis Financing Conference. This idea that there's going to be more domestic resource mobilization for precisely these kinds of issues that countries would increase their own budgets through better taxation and less corruption. They would take those budgets and put more of them into their own direct education, health, et cetera, budgets. Well, this pandemic, one of the effects of it likely to, is likely to be that many of the countries we're talking about will see their, their government revenues drop dramatically. I mean, tourism is a big part for many countries that's going close to zero at this stage, right? Commodity prices are at historic lows for the exporters. So suddenly domestic resource mobilization isn't there. We had all sort of thought we were moving to this new era past foreign aid. We might need more foreign aid than ever before. How do you think about that dynamic and this challenge of funding these huge inequities and gaps in the world? Yeah, that does require a lot of, you know, much more creative thinking than we've had so far, because you've talked about, you know, countries that are already, you know, fragile, conflict affected, the poorest countries, but actually we see a lot of the problems also, you know, as a result of the pandemic, maybe some of the middle income countries are going to suffer, you know, a a severe GDP downgrade um, and are very much connected to global, you know, supply chains and value chains. I mean, obviously we're seeing the impact of the the tourist in, on the tourist industry, on the garment industry you know that is going to impact a lot of countries um, that were coming out of the worst you know sort of situations of poverty where it's going to plunge a very large number of people into poverty again so one effort that we're trying to really push for of course is around debt and debt relief and that is something that i think collectively we need to push you know sort of wealthier nations at the moment to really show solidarity by you know making sure that countries don't have to worry about you know also you know debt repayment but ultimately it will also come from additional you know resources to be put in and I think there is an, an absolute urgency in getting the development financial, um, financial institutions, you know, the DFIs, to really come in and, uh, um, you know, put an injection of money, a, a deep injection of money in right now before it's too late, you know, to try and, you know, support some of the most uh, um, fragile economies. And, and it's, it's been too slow, you know, but be, be, there's been a lot of talk around this, but it's just not happening at the pace that, you know, we should see. Yeah, they would say, and I've interviewed many of these heads of the DFIs, that they're doing it, they're on it, they, they give you pretty big sounding headline numbers, but there are plenty of others who'll say, if you look below the headline numbers, it's a lot of business as usual still, given the scale mm-hmm. of the, the challenge that we're facing. And when it comes to debt relief, it's a similar issue, Sarah, where you know, so far there's been a moratorium on interest payments, but uh, that interest is still going to be due. Uh, I think currently it's the early 2021 uh, that that payment will have to start being made again based on the G20 mm-hmm. agreement. A lot of the private um, lenders still haven't come to an agreement, as I understand it. So there's still so to me, there's, this, this comes to two things. You know, one is about getting the voice of citizens to push for this change, because ultimately it's the shareholders that decide, no? and the shareholders will only be moved if you know, their citizens demand a change. And the pandemic has already created a moment in which we're seeing you know, people taking to the streets because these inequalities, the inequities of our you know, society, of the, of, you know, global society, it's something that has become you know, much more apparent as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. And, and actually for all of us working on development and humanitarian issues, I think for too long, we have put you know, economic and social issues issues ahead of perhaps political and civil rights. And we see with the pandemic that this is coming back. And I think it's important that maybe foundations can play a role in that as well, you know, in really supporting these, you know, civil society movements to be stronger in their demands, you know, asking their governments to act, you know, responsibly on a global stage, you know, to, to be more accountable in terms of, you know, how um, they play their role on the global stage. And, and maybe that's the reset that we need to see. I mean, interestingly, you know, the WEF talks of the Great Reset, the, the, the session has been called the Global Reset. That's what we've been calling for. We called for the Global Reset. We convened a number of world leaders. And that was precisely because we think there is a global response that we need that brings together all sorts of you know, players from civil society, businesses, but from all around the world. We all have something to contribute and also to push those who can. 
to act more forcefully. Yeah, it seems like we're all searching for some kind of opportunity to turn this difficult, challenging crisis into something positive, into a new vision, because going back to how things were itself isn't sufficient, right? We were on a, on a we were not on the right trajectory as it was before this pandemic hit. I think uh, maybe Ahmed, you wanted to jump in and comment. Yes, actually, I, I just want to say that we have to have this opportunity and we have to listen to the people. And I think we have to to share everybody to to be part of it. We we cannot leave this only for the individual, uh, whether for the public or only for private sector. Yes, private sector, they are playing a very big role. Uh, public, they are doing very well. But I think we have also to listen to the people. Um, I'm, I'm looking at... I'm looking at it as a humanitarian. Uh, I think it is, uh, we used to, uh, you know, provide the, the humanitarian aid for, for the people, but we are not listening to the people. I remember when I visit one of the refugee uh, camp, I mean, in the, in the uh, Syrian uh, neighbor countries, and many of the things that it's uh, uh, provided by, uh, the international NGOs or the UN agencies, it's, it's just, I mean, they, they um, relay on, on the report and many of the time they are just relaying on, on the media. No, we have to, to listen to the refugees, what they want and how can we act and how can we also think innovative way because, you know, sometimes you can get an idea from the people who are in need it could not have it in the UN agencies or in the private sector either, because, you know, the people who are in need there, they know what they need and they what they want. I remember one time when I've been in one of the refugee camp in Somalia um, and one uh, woman told me that, please, we don't need your help. I lose my livelihood. Just bring me my livelihood again and I will support myself, I will support my family. So I think we have to listen. And I think the, um, the, the global reset should not leave anyone behind, should um, take uh, the, the consideration for everybody. And uh, we should to, uh, to look at, at it in um, many perspectives and in, in different angle, rather than just look at it in economic side or in you know humanitarian side or only in the public side so i think private public and civil society or ngos should be also participate on this uh, global reset i think that's a powerful vision this idea that we before the pandemic there was a growing theme around becoming more user centered or customer centric or people centered you you pick your terminology but the idea that even someone in need, a refugee, even someone living in extreme poverty, that we should see them more like a neighbor or a, or a partner, not a victim, right? And that if they have a voice in this, they'll, they'll design better interventions, better solutions for themselves than we ever could sitting in Washington, DC or London or somewhere else. And that idea was already gaining steam, especially with the advent of new technologies that make it so much easier to directly connect with people, to send them money, for example, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting vision that perhaps the reset can really be much more people-centered, uh, redesigning the way we think of humanitarian and development work in a much more people-centered way. Does anyone want to pick up on Ahmed's point, uh, either Blair or Javier? Yeah, I, I think one thing that's really important in this is um, there's kind of a paradox that we have to do if you take Sarah's point and Ahmed's point together, which is we have to move ridiculously fast and we have to be incredibly centered locally, right? So think about two phrases, local first and massive fast, and we have to do those simultaneously, right? And that's a hard thing to do simultaneously. So it's, it's going to require rethinking the leaders of humanitarian institutions to, to make that work because they're, they're going to have to step up their game in a way, right? Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the nice, in a sense, the other silver lining of COVID is it taught us we can do massive fast. If I given you, if I given you a bet that said we're going to shut down massive parts of the global economy virtually overnight, and I gave you thousand one odds, uh, 
you wouldn't have taken that bet, right? Um, but, but it happened, right? And, and so we've now learned that actually we can, so let's apply that in different contexts. That's the first one. I think the second point is, is that actually, one of the things I worry about with the tone of the conversation until where we just turned is we're talking about distributing a fixed resource, which is actually pretty broke right now, right? And I think what we have to do is actually find the hope and the energy in people to create resource, right? And so one of the benefits that comes from saying to a person in dire straits, what is it you would like to do? Is they actually then frame back to you, this is my hope, this is my dream, this is my wish, right? And, and, it's, and in a sense, you should think about that as an investment rather than a, than a give, right? It's essentially, if you mean that, I'm behind you, let's, let's make that work. And so, you know, it's, it's a bad analogy, but think about essentially the world as a massive VC for all the people who are trying to achieve their dreams. Um, and, and so I think there's this issue of creating a sense, a context that allows people to hope and then sort of create their way out of the answer and facilitate that activity, right? Um, and, and then that gets rid of the whole issue about where does, who, how do we distribute the wealth? Because it, it's about how do we create new by using the energy that sits in people's hopes and dreams and aspirations. But, but we gotta do that. I mean, the, the thing I wanna highlight is, it really back to the point that Maria made, we do not have much time, right? I mean, if you take the climate piece, in a decade, this world will, it starts to unravel in a really bad way and it accelerates all the other issues we're worried about. COVID has just put a whole bunch of people in much dire straits than they were before. And so we can't putz around while we do this. So massive fast is really critical. Javier, I think you wanted to jump in as well. Thank you. You know, I, I strongly believe that, you know, from words to action, and, and walking the talk. And, and when we look right now, if you put yourself in the in in the lives of affected people, people I, I will just bring the comment from Ahmed. Right now, the entire humanitarian ecosystem must concentrate and invest on livelihoods. If we invest in livelihood support, if we dedicate two uh, arms of support. One, to recover livelihoods. Two, to protect livelihoods. What we will do is a significant transformation in the life of people. By investing in, in livelihoods, we are going to really, really make transformation in terms of the well-being status of the people that right now is tremendously badly affected. And at the same time, by properly invested, investing in livelihoods, what we can do is to ensure that communities, uh, individuals will be more self-protected. There is a huge and immense need to invest on social safety nets, meaning to create, this, to, to strengthen the existing social safety nets in order to expand the reach, to reach to the more, more people that is in need. And finally, if we want to do a, a truly transformation, it requires a political will to create the conditions for social protection mechanism that will really help these livelihoods to be protected, those well-being that will be enhanced and the self-protection to be in place. So I think we have a tremendous action ahead, but I would say it should be focused now in the livelihoods. And I, I see your point, and social safety nets are, I think, becoming a much higher priority issue within the development humanitarian communities. But, you know, livelihoods, like so many of the other issues we've talked about, is going through its own transformation as, you know, entire industries shift, to, you know, 3D printing means that maybe we won't go to such easy moves of light manufacturing to the poorest countries in the world. Those might shift from where they are now to being much more localized, including in rich countries, right? There's a big move due to the pandemic to bring home manufacturing to countries that want their supply chain closer to them. Um, and a lot of industries, uh, whether it's tourism or commodity-based industries may see big disruptions, both due to the pandemic and due to automation and technology change, trade war, globalization. So it's not an easy environment to think about stabilizing 
livelihoods. It may, it may not be so easy as to turn back to what we had a year ago. I, I wanna see if others wanna pick up on any of the themes we've, we've gotten into already. Maria, perhaps I saw you nodding along. Well, now look, the focus on livelihoods, that is one thing that we're really thinking about is, so where does the foundation for us, like where do we go deep? And I think the concept of, you know, one of the biggest impediments for people um, being unable to get out of poverty is that they don't have access to energy. They don't have access to reliable electricity. They can't, um, they can't uh, set up their own businesses with just a, a, a level of electrification that just gets them started. And so when you think of livelihoods, I do think for each of our organizations, it's like, how can we impact that particular component? And when we think of like the greener, smarter, equitable recovery, I mean, infrastructure can often be a big driver of pulling things out. But as we think about infrastructure, it often doesn't, um, it doesn't seep down to the most vulnerable communities because the most vulnerable communities still will not have the access to energy to really enable them to participate in the modern economy. And so we're looking at this from like a green infrastructure standpoint from an, let, let's step back and let's look at the overall uh, sector what's going on at the very large level, which I do think is important and what regulatory movement needs to take place. And then perhaps at the foundation level, maybe we enter at the, at the parts with distributable renewable energy that can help like very small uh, consumers, small businesses tap into the grid to then operate their livelihood. So I think this whole concept of how do you empower local communities, small businesses to become more easier within the economies that they live in so that they themselves can bring, bring themselves into the fold, I think is important. But the, the topics you raise, you know, globalization hasn't really been thought of. Um, I know Blair has done a lot of research on this, like globalization for all the benefits of globalization. There's also been unintended impacts on local communities. So we need to think about that technology um, is going to displace certain jobs. So how do we, as we address, you know, going forward, I think getting ahead of some of these themes and looking at, okay, well, what does that mean for certain African countries, for example, certain populations, how do they participate in this new world if some of the businesses that they were anticipating coming their way are not going to be there anymore? And trade flows are certainly probably not going back to the way they were. Even before the pandemic, there were issues with global trade flows. And I think now, um, you know, rethinking some of these areas is just critical as we go forward. Yeah, the way you're thinking about using an issue like energy as a way to empower people in local communities to rise up sounds a lot like what Blair was describing as a way to give people a chance to create their own resources as opposed to just thinking about maybe a, a foreign aid mindset, a top-down kind of mindset. The other item I'd add to that agenda, which I think is particularly relevant during this pandemic, is connectivity, right? We, we always knew there was this digital divide, but boy, it has become really visceral at a moment like this within our own communities. I live in the United States. And if you don't have good internet access at home, your kids might not really be able to get their education. And uh, another family with good internet access with the ability to afford it or who lives in the right area might have that. It's a very stark divide based on something which nowadays has become kind of like basic infrastructure. You need to have connectivity just like you need to have electricity. And perhaps when you think of a great reset, it could include a big, bold vision around enabling rapid deployment of broadband connectivity around the world. Certainly, uh, a number of the companies that work in that space have done very well during this pandemic and have seen their, their market value grow dramatically. Maybe there's an opportunity for them to take a leadership role in delivering connectivity to people who really need it. Um, I think Blair and Ahmed both wanted to come in. Go ahead, Blair. Yeah, so Raj, I think a really important point on this is that left to its own devices, infrastructure and technology as we know it today concentrates wealth. 
but it doesn't have to actually, right? And it turns out energy can be created locally and distributed locally in a way we've never seen before, right? Uh, knowledge can be created locally and distributed locally in a way we've never seen before. Your point about 3D printing, 3D printing permits local economic activity to occur. Um, and so we could take the same tools that, that created concentrated wealth and flip them on their head and say, we want you to do the opposite thing right now, which is actually create massive potential local wealth, right? And, and, and it's sort of like, um, it doesn't make sense to globalize if you're not building off of thriving local economies. So let's start with building thriving local economies and then worry about globalizing. That's actually completely achievable with the technology we have today. We're just not being thoughtful about its application and therefore the unintended consequences is, is wealth concentration. It could be exactly the reverse if we chose to do that. Ahmed, do you want to jump in on this as well? Yes, I just want to add something here, and I, I just mentioned earlier about it, which is how can we provide the aid and humanitarian aid in an innovative way? And we have to put ourselves in their shoes rather than just thinking in behalf of them. So it is very important because sometimes what I need here, for example, in Doha, it is, might not be the same there in New York. You know what I mean? So I think we have to, to, to be a little bit more um, thinking out of the books and try to bring the innovation that to help people. And it, it's not necessary, uh, necessary to be a, a very high tech. It might be very simple, but it, in an in innovative way. And this is why I always say that it's very important to bring the private sector with the UN agencies together in very level, I mean, in very executive high level so we can think how can we act and how can we uh, help the people in the way that the people need to be helped yeah well you know one of the one of the areas i mentioned earlier that has been very successful maybe you could argue more successful than some of the traditional development humanitarian agencies are these public private partnerships at a very high level global fund for example to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. And part of the reason is they are specific to an issue that you can get a coalition around. Um, they are something that companies can understand because there's a framework that allows them to fit in. But ultimately, the money is spent at a local level, and governments play a very big role, and they de develop their own and design their own approach. So th there may be some lesson in that. We now see a new similar initiative being launched, the ACT Accelerator, which is raising some $40 billion to develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics for the pandemic. Can, can a similar model work, but for other issues in development, for humanitarian issues, for financial inclusion, or for humanitarian aid? Are there other opportunities to use these, these innovative public-private alliance models to do something different than we've done before when you think of the great reset before us. I don't know if anyone wants to pick up from there or add their own view or, or, or tell me I'm crazy. Um, Sarah, maybe, do you want to jump in? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, I mean, that goes back to my earlier point just around these coalitions. I totally believe in them. And I think, especially in this moment of, you know, crisis of traditional multilateralism, they, you know, probably provide a good you know, opportunity for hope <laughs> to, to really get something concrete done. On digitalization, in, we just recently launched, um, is, is the, the, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, launched this Vision 2030 alliances, you know, led, co-chaired by UNDP and the president of Botswana, and brings together, you know, some of the biggest tech companies, a number of um, organizations, think tanks like ODI, but also um, in smaller businesses, other government representatives, that are really trying to see how we can use digitalization to advance progress towards delivering the SDGs. So using the best that you know, the, the private sector can bring to this in terms of you know, knowledge, in terms of expertise, in terms of you know, infrastructure, with you know, what we can do on the government side in terms of regulations, in terms of you know, putting the framework around that for specific 
issues for specific problems and we are you know the, the, this was just launched in Davos in January we're working through this identifying you know some key areas some key sectors in which we can start you know spearheading you know advancing certain things so these coalitions are becoming more and more you know the thing to really to go for also on the humanitarian side you know, the, the humanitarian investing initiative that you know the forum um, launched where we're really trying to incentivize more de-risking you know so that we can get more business money into areas where businesses would not traditionally invest, you know, to try and stimulate impact investment by getting governments or, D or DFIs to the risk. Um, so th these things are happening, and I think the more, you know, we bring um, a variety of players together, not just the usual suspects, I would say, but also the less usual ones that may bring different energy, different thinking to these things, then, you know, the more we're going to have impact, I think. And they may not even approach it as a development or as a humanitarian issue for them. It might be a business initiative. But of course, that's why it's so important to have the civil society voices at the table and government voices to make sure it's shaped in a way that reaches the most vulnerable, that leaves no one behind. But there are huge opportunities, I agree, with these kinds of fit for purpose coalitions. Do, does anyone else want to pick up uh, on any of these themes or add a new one? Go ahead, Javier. Yeah, no, definitely coalitions are extremely important. Uh, IFRC launched the One Billion Coalition for Resilience, for, exam uh, for example, how we can reach to one billion people by not ourselves in a coalition with the participation of different, different institutions on, on, on achieving the resilience. But there, there is something that to me is of, of particular importance that I think that makes the difference in terms of what we want to achieve. And one of those is whatever coalition that this from the humanitarian or community development work has to start with an objective that the respect and dignity in terms of how we interact with communities how we engage with communities is going to be the paramount starting point that we understand also the cultural dynamics in communities and how cultural dynamic dynamics should influence the activities of these coalitions because coalitions that come and just enter to, to a community might be worse than the medicine. And what is important is to engage in any partnership with the communities, understand their culture, the long, their languages, their beliefs, their values, and based on that, build a button up, although a coalition can be a top down. But it's important to create this notion of ownership empowerment because otherwise it will not be sustainable. And, uh, I, and I think it's crit critical to, to, to think on, on this, that the dignity and respect is absolutely crucial component for any coalition uh, looking from the bottom up. You, you see my book just randomly placed over my shoulder, um, The Business of Changing the World. I, in that book, I actually give a, a, an accounting of many of the failed aid projects and Javier, you're exactly right. Uh, very often when they fail, it's because a, a bunch of smart people think they have a great idea and they go and impose it on a community and lo and behold, things don't actually work that way. Um, and lots of money gets wasted and sometimes actual harm is done uh, to people who really didn't ask for this. Uh, so it's, it's a very important point. I'm glad you raise it here. Uh, does anyone else want to come in? I, I noticed that the time, our time is quickly running out. So maybe I'll just uh, go around and ask everyone to give us your final, your final thoughts as we wrap up uh, what has been a pretty fast-paced conversation. It's, it's gone quick. Um, maybe Ahmed, would you like to, to give us your final thoughts? Well, um, yes, of course. I, I think the most important I'm, I might uh, yeah, uh, uh, emphasize and it's partnership, listen to the people, innovative way, thinking out of the box, bring everybody and try to act fast and save the money and save the life. Thank you for that. Very well stated, stated very succinct, and all the key points I think we've all raised during the, the discussion. Uh, maybe Maria, would you like to go next? I want to emphasize, I think, the notion of execution. I think a lot of these populations, they need support now. And so in whatever... Um, reset that we do, that the focus is squarely on execution, execution that focuses on what the local populations and local communities need. And then on the other hand, broadening our 
um, thinking on channeling, whether it's grant capital, whether it's um, uh, development institution dollars, um, as we structure these offerings in a collaborative way, um, think of offerings that connect and align with these different pools of capital so that, you know, I'm, what you said of, of uh, private companies coming in and feeling engaged, this concept of engagement and really thinking how to engage each different pool with an achievable results, I think is, is the way we bring more dollars in. And we certainly need to bring more dollars in. Thank you for that. And Blair, uh, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think uh, the final, I mean, I love what was already said. I think the, the additional pieces to it are, first of all, I think we have a paradoxical problem. And the paradoxical problem is the following, which is we have to be incredibly local on a response, but there are a few things the world shares in common. And so we actually have to figure out how to solve that really, really quickly. So let me do two quick elaborations. Um, I think that one of the dangers of having lots of points of light is that actually they don't add up to what we need. And so I think we need to agree on one or two very serious things. And I heard two here that I completely agree with. One of them is we've got to actually create a green economy. We've got to, we got to solve the climate problem. And the second one is we have to create a huge number of opportunities for people. And I would say it's not just um, livelihoods, it's actually businesses, right? So, you know, let's, Put a number out there we need 50 million new businesses 100 million new businesses in the world in the next decade something like that agree on a couple of umbrella pieces and then work really hard locally to get the people engaged in the way that the group has talked about and then the second one i think is COVID has taught us we can do things massive and fast i want to highlight a few things if you think a problem really matters you're willing to bet the farm you'll actually solve it right Second thing is that if you get a lot of people engaged in the conversation, very diverse communities, and you're going to understand it's highly ambiguous, but you're willing to take a decision, that's the kind of leadership we need. Engaged, but willing to take a decision. Engaged, but willing to take a decision. Because without that, we won't make the progress we need. And, and I think the final one is we've got to find governance models that actually allow us to do things in much more expedited fashions than we have, which is why I really like what the UN is trying to propose with the development platform model. And, and I think if we do that, and, 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 and I'd love us to, just as the world agree, that, that there's these two moonshots, right? If you go back to what they did, they galvanized everyone. If we create one or two moonshots that we all agree on and then be incredibly local, it, we, we could have an amazing world um, instead of the world we have right now. Thank you. Lots of really important themes that, again, I would love to pick up on, but given the time, I'm just going to bring it over to Javier and see if you have any final thoughts you'd like to yeah, share. Just a just few ones. The first one is, you know, a commodity that humanitarians always relied on is on trust. And I think trust applies for governments, for private sector, for humanitarians, etc. And it's an important commodity that we need to look vis-a-vis the needs of communities and how communities see uh, they are being cared from, from the different organizations, governments, etc. So building trust is, is extremely important. And secondly, just to remind ourselves that today or tonight, hundreds of millions of people is going to bed without any food in their stomach. And that dichotomy of trust and hunger is what creates tensions, create distrust, and that's something that we need to put always into the equation of our balance in, in our act. Thank you very much for reminding us as well of some of those basic realities of the world we live in. And Sarah, some final thoughts for you. Thanks, Raj. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a blog the title for which was, we can't go back to normal because normal was the problem. And I think that is something that throughout the pandemic we've seen emerge very clearly, you know, this, this push from, um, from citizens to see something different. Um, north and south, you know, in, in rich societies, in poorer societies, to really use this opportunity to build societies that are fairer, you know, that are really, well, yeah, 
people feel you know, that their rights are respected and protected and more sustainable. And crises are often moments of bold change. We've seen that throughout history. You know, they are the moments where multilateral innovation takes place, where big you know, economic shifts, economic thinking you know, can come to the fore. So I think this is really the moment to, you know, to, to build something better. And, and more parochially for us, you know, in terms of the sector, you know, we, we're seeing all these debates around decolonizing development, decolonizing humanitarian action, is really to take that seriously and reframe you know, the way in which we operate. But to Blair's point, I think the test for the global reset is to ensure that lead, the leaders listen, that they work you know, hand in hand with civil society, with businesses, because they are already demanding this change and creating this change. But we need to push the leadership to take that on board and uh, make it happen. Well, a fascinating discussion, lots of threads uh, that I think will fit into a broader debate about what this great reset ought to be. I'm reminded of Bill Gates's comment where he says that we often overestimate what we can achieve in one year, but underestimate what's possible in 10 years. And, you know, for those of us who go to the, the global circuit of, of events, whether it's the World Economic Forum or UN General Assembly or the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul, sometimes you walk away thinking, was this really worth it? You know, do these big global gatherings where we're trying to debate about questions like this actually make real change? But a moment like this, when the world is in an unprecedented crisis, is when we will lay out the roadmap for what does that next 10 years look like. And if we get it right, if we make sure it involves citizen voices, if we put people at the center, if we take all of the sage advice we've heard from this panel about how to shape it, I think there's huge potential um, as much as we're staring down a very, very challenging moment for so many people around the world. So I appreciate all of you for an energizing conversation. It was interesting. I, uh, I thank the organizers. And I thank everybody who's been a part of this listening in today. Uh, I will say goodbye and be well. Bye and thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you very thank much. Bye bye. Thanks. And well done, Rush. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.